This is LCC Radio, WLNZ 89.7 here in Lansing, Michigan. This is Lansing Online News Radio with Bonnie and Bill. We're here in the bowels of Lansing Community College. (laughs) It's been one of those days, Bill. Mm, The colon. (laughs) The colon. Yeah, we're in the colon of it. Well, the good news is that it's nice and cool down here. You see, my blood is so nice and thin now from our cool spring that I'm not sure I can handle all this heat. And we're going to have a big storm coming and then a heat wave coming after that this weekend with huge humidity, I guess. Oh, no. Yeah, that'll just... Because we haven't had it yet. No, we haven't. We haven't been here yet. It's going to be very uncomfortable for people. Although, if if we don't quit with the storms, my dogs will never recover. My (laughs) dogs... I mean, I have never seen... The Paxil truck is just going to have to back up to the house (laughs) with a giant trough and put it in... Can you buy dog food with it already? Oh, (laughs) we got to do something because it's just terrible. I have two dogs that are both utterly neurotic. One dog hides behind the computers and tears all the wiring out. So Mm -hmm. you have to build big barricades to keep her out from there. Yeah, it gets exciting. We better not have that. We're not going to have bad weather for the weekend, are we? No, weather's supposed to be nice, but humid. But humid. Very humid. There's three big events coming up. Yeah, they're they're all in Old Town, and they've become sort of like centerpieces for the beginning of summer. Festival of the Moon on Friday night. All right. Festival of the Sun on Saturday. Which you think would be Sunday. And then Scrap Fest. And then scrap fest, kind yeah. of overlaid around it, and there it's music and drinking primarily. Yeah. Um, but it's a uh, very controlled in Old Town. It doesn't seem to get out of hand. It seems to be very sophisticated. It does, and doesn't it? Just, it? Yeah, people aren't you know barfing on the streets. No, it's not yeah. a binge drinking event. No, it doesn't no. seem that way, and it's no. become their centerpiece, and it's also their centerpiece fundraiser. That's good too. Yeah, that's a nice community there. That's how many years? Do you have any idea? At least 10. Oh, really? Ah. It started when I was uh, had an office in Old Town. And it was a, it started with the Festival of the Sun, which was, you know, sort of the entry in the summer. And then somebody decided uh, maybe we ought to do something the night before that's uh, even more laid back. Ah. So the Festival of the Moon began. And there, there, you'll see it. There's huge lines. There are. Yeah, it's very, very well attended. That's good news. They'll have good weather. There is one event also the day before... Area photographer Roxanne Frith uh, has been having some health difficulties and needs a kidney transplant, which is going to make it difficult for her to work. And the Creole Gallery is holding a show where some of the proceeds are going to go to help her defray some of her costs as she recovers from her illness. And I think many people who support the local art scene know Roxanne, and that would be a good place uh, for people to congregate the day before all of these festivities kick off. That's on Thursday. So it's going to be quite the Old Town weekend. Yeah, it sure is. And Old Town deserves it. It looks nice. It has a good feel to it. Yeah. It, they've done a lot of work for very little money and over a long period of time. Well, you said also that there was one author you wanted to mention, Matt Bell. Absolutely. Matt who's Bell. sort of blowing up here. He's a Michigan author. You do com, so you keep track of all these Yes. He, uh, Matt Bell has been a senior editor for a, a publishing company in um Westland Ann Arbor area for about two years and it's called Danzac Press so he basically what he does is read manuscripts and he is also he's got a um, um, he teaches at Northern Michigan University he's a senior lecturer there and he's written his debut novel and it's called In the House <laughs> Upon the Dirt Between the Lake and the Woods which has got a good if you think about it it's after, musical after you read the book, you'll understand how the title works, because he writes like that in some ways. Oh, does he? He writes in a biblical kind of way. Yeah. It's kind of, a, it's a very much of a throwback, but this is what is called fabulous journal or uh, writing. Okay. Um, magic it's, realism it's, type? Yes, can be referred to as magic realism. There's a lot of different names for it. Uh, but it's about um, the concept of fatherhood and things that go awry. There, in, a, in the article I wrote for City Pulse this last week, I, I did mention that there's a she bear in it and a squid. So <laughs> hard to weave in both, you, isn't you it? Have, you have to realize when you're reading this, this is a book that is not a typical uh, book that you pick up and read. But if you like um, Grimm's fairy tales, or well, maybe Gabriel Garcia Marquez, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And he's, he's had reviews in the New York Times, uh, the Wall Street Journal. He had a two-page review in Publishers Weekly that included an interview with him. So, I mean, this is a book. He's getting big attention. It's there. huge attention. And a lot of it, I, I ask him about it, and I think a lot of it is due to the time he has put in 
working with young, younger people than him, editing their manuscripts and saying yes or no to him, and he's also incredible with social media. Oh. And he told me, and I, I did write about it in the paper, he said it's, it's our second life. It's not, it's not something that's unusual for people his age. They've grown up with it. How old is he again? He's 32. Oh, so he is in that age group. He's in that age group. He grew up with it. He, his entire you know, kind of adult life that he's had so far. That's, People in that age range, they went to Twitter like crazy. Yep. You know, and many of them have abandoned Facebook in favor of Twitter. Is he a, is he a Twitter guy? He's a Twitter and a Facebook okay. um, and any other social media source he can find. And it's I think it's proven uh, that for him that some of the, like Flavorware, for example, some of the online... Uh, really hot, hot online uh, kind of determiners of our culture, frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, the Daily Beast, they've all reviewed them. Oh, wow. Great review. I mean, great reviews. Wow. Uh, and he's going to be at Schuler's Wednesday, June 19th, and he's going to be in the Lansing Schuler's, which is in the Eastwood Town Center. Right? So that's this Wednesday? Yep, at 7 p.m. And I think anybody that wants to see an emerging author who is probably going to be, uh, and he said, I'm not going to write that book again. Uh, he said, I won't do it. He, he wants to write something else. I think of books like Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Persig never really wrote another I mean, he wrote another book, but I mean, yeah. that was his book. He had waited his whole life to write it. When he wrote it, that was it. And maybe that's what this gentleman is saying, that this is his book. His, it could be, but he want, I mean, he's, gonna, he's already got another novel almost ready to go. Uh, it's unlike this. He's not going to yeah. stick to that style. He's going to try something new. Uh, yeah, but <laughs> Zen and the... Uh, Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, for people who don't know, the uh, author, uh, prior to writing that book, wrote um, Program Learning Guides. Yes. And he was at MSU for a while. Well, he was? Yeah. I didn't know he was. Oh, that's cool. Pretty bizarre. Oh, that's great. But uh, and if you read the book, you can understand how oh, it absolutely. fits with the Program Learning Guide because... It, he always, know, he talks about writing the manual. It's writing, it's written like a manual. Absolutely. I hated those things. Oh, yeah, yeah. And all our science classes... For in the, with those. One of my other favorite authors, and there's actually, my, and there must be two of them out there because it's Thomas Berger, but he used to, he would sort of write the deconstructed detective novel, then he would write the deconstructed romance, and so maybe this is what uh, uh, Mr. Bell is going to do? I think so, and then I, I'd like to get people starting to think about seeing uh, Gordon Young, who's written a book about Flint, Michigan. It's called Teardown. It's nonfiction. Uh, Gordon Young has had a blog on Flint, which is called the Flint Expats, for four or five years. And that's how he came to the notice of publishers. Mm. Uh, he's done that every day for that period of time. But this is, Gordon grew up in Flint, Michigan. And this is a story about him going back to Flint, Michigan with the naive idea that he would buy a house there. And by doing that, he would help save Flint, Michigan. Ooh. <laughs> Mm. This yeah. was sort of the Don Quixote quest? <laughs> yeah, it sure was. Uh, did he have a Sancho Panza along with him? <laughs> no. No, no just him? No, and his girlfriend wouldn't join him either. She wouldn't join him, I wondered. Fact, usually, one, uh, women usually play that role. Yeah, at one point she understood that he was totally too much obsessed with this idea. And she had, when he'd go back to California where he lives, San Francisco, she created a no Flint zone. A no Flint zone. <laughs> oh, funny. And he funny. writes about that in his story. But I think people will find it interesting because it's a different approach. It's about hope. It isn't, say, Charlie Lindos was pretty acerbic. Right. But he, but he always surprised me by saying how hopeful he was. Yeah. And I wondered if he wasn't paying attention. Yeah, this is somewhat about hope, too. I mean, uh -huh. he tells the real stories uh, of Flint. The one thing that surprises him about two-thirds of the way through the book, people start showing him their, their guns. And he yes, started really. with a dose of reality. Yeah. Average people who live there own guns. Right. They don't go out for a walk at night without their gun. And he's like, whoa. Yeah. So, I mean, but it was interesting that um, he just took a different approach. But it was, again, living in the city, kind of like Mark Benelli did, and Detroit City is the place to be. Well, it's interesting that Detroit gets all the attention, of course, because it was the large motor city, murder city. Flint is really the one that per capita is more violent than Detroit ever was. It is the most dangerous city in America. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And, and he talks about it in the book. Um, he doesn't try to deny that. And I've been in Flint quite a bit, and there are, there are streets in Flint you cannot drive down yeah. because of trees that have been down for hmm, six months. I mean, right across the street. It, there's entire blocks. It's, it's a mini Detroit. But what makes it even wor worse in a way is at one time, 1975, Flint had the number one, was number one in the country for disposable income. Yeah. So in a generation, right. it went from 
number one to the lowest rating in America for a city. I also, I mean, the Mott Foundation put $5 million into a community policing experiment there. And they divided the city into 64 or 68 beats. And they were two-person beats where mm -hmm. police officers shared the beat different times of day, but they would, uh, it was their community and they had, their challenge was to figure out how to make it safer. And it was really part of that early experimentation. It was a lot freer than some of the other experiments that took place around the country, more creative, mm -hmm. um, much more community-based, decentralized than some of the other approaches. And they were extraordinarily successful in bringing down the violence rates. The irony, of course, was that the people who had donated the money for the project, the Mott Foundation, insisted that they didn't just use it to defray existing costs, that they would actually add this on top, right? Well, somehow, surprisingly, they had the same number of police officers at the end of the experiment as they did at the beginning, so there were some... I mean, the city was in such economic chaos, it was very difficult for them not to just use it for regular operating expenses. But it was a real bellwether of what could be done if you could mobilize communities to make themselves safer, just using the police as a resource officer or a catalyst, rather than to have them come in and use arrest as the solution to the problem. And it's too bad that they have faltered since then, because I think they were really at the forefront of that kind of unique ways for people to just grab a hold of their own communities. And that's kind of the focus of the story, is how, how people that live there take the community in, you know, under their own wing. Yeah. They, they sort of take control of their own neighborhood because there's there's times when there are no police on the beat, period. Well, I said the real thing we should do is teach community policing without the police. Mm -hmm. The police were the only ones who really didn't like it. <laughs> 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 a lot of the officers that got excited about it were shunned by their peers. So really what you have to do is tell the community how to work together to make themselves safer. And that's what they're doing there. And, yeah. You know, I, I, don't, I didn't come away with it, the, the hope he did, because I'm probably more... I guess in a way more pragmatic what I see there. I mean, they've lost 80,000 automotive jobs. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you, there's nothing that replaces that. Nothing. I, I mean, mean, I, I, I keep know. quoting quoting James Altucher, who the Altucher Confidential, my favorite blog, where he said, uh, the world has changed and we just haven't realized that the change is permanent. That Kodak up in Rochester, New York, employed 144,000 people yeah. at its peak. Instagram has replaced them and they have 13 employees. <laughs> so those other 140,000 some people have to figure out then how do I make a living and stay alive. And what does Rochester do? Right, exactly. So that's the challenge nowadays, very much the challenge. You know, and he also writes quite a bit about the land or the uh, land bank there because that's where it came to fruition, the first yes. land bank was yeah. in Genesee County. A lot of gardening experimentation there yep. too, community gardens. Yep. And uh, he has positive things to say about the land bank in, in the Flint area. He says its only problem is it's been too successful mm. because they own too many houses. But yeah. he said he'd rather have that than the land speculators. And he doesn't have much, uh, many good things to say about land speculators because many of them are out of state. They bought these places off eBay and they had they'd never heard of things like scrappers. Yes. You know, two yeah. days after the house is empty, it's also empty of it's anything. A, yeah. yeah. Stripped. Mm -hmm. Stripped, mm -hmm. yeah. Anything yeah. copper, any, anything's gone. Well, see, the nice thing, though, about the garden projects that they had in Flint, because I watched a presentation from the woman who had been in charge of that, was that the communities had such ownership in it. It wasn't just sort of Lady Bountiful-type suburbanites coming in to help. These were organic things that grew up out of the community, that they guarded them and didn't have vandalism, mm -hmm. which is the big problem with a lot of community gardens. You know, if people really aren't in the community aren't invested in them, um, then those gardens kind of get wrecked by kids and so forth. But they were pretty successful with that, so maybe there is some hope there. Yep, and it probably relies on the citizens that continue to live there. Yeah. At, all, at any cost, frankly. Well, I am going to defray some conversation about, um, because I, well, first of all, to be completely transparent, I live out near where Jackson National Life, which is actually now Lansing, of course, under the 425 agreement, we have a patch of Lansing that's seven miles away from Lansing, doesn't even touch the city. Um, but there's a big foo -fra going on tonight at the 8 o'clock meeting out in Allerton Township because residents discovered that the new plans for this new imaging center that they're building weren't going to go next to the headquarters, but were going to jump Okemos Road and go behind some of the homes there. And apparently it was because the facility was not terribly attractive and they didn't want it near their headquarters, which sort of says Naya Wave comes out to the rural area. So we're going to see a little problem there. It's also a concern because some of the neighbors are very concerned about what's called spot zoning, where you just sort of pick a place and the tiny little area 
change it to light industrial and totally change the whole character of the community. Um, there's a lot of concern that once you start deeding land to Lansing like that, it's just going to chew its way through the township. Mm -hmm. um, they're putting $3 million of state tax funds into a sewer system for their new upgrade that they're doing, but they're not letting any of the residents who live along those roads tap in because their property will still be Allerton Township, and unless you're part of Lansing, you don't get to tap into the sewer it's system. Not of that. It's not part of that 425. So the sewer goes right in front of your house, but you can't tap in. Um, those are the kinds of things that make these agreements and it makes people angry. Over to, oh, yeah, sure. Not in my backyard becomes a different issue. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll be bringing a wrap up on that. I hope next week, and we'll take a little closer look at that. So let me get this straight: the residents are not only concerned about spot zoning, jumping across the street, which will cause traffic problems, but aren't aren't they concerned about it? The building and also an ugly building. Yes, it's Naya Wave all over again. Yeah. And it's in my, you know, not in my backyard. It's going to be directly in their backyard. <laughs> yeah. And it's going to be on some wetlands that they're afraid are going to lead to all those kinds of flooded basements that you run into once you see that kind of construction going. So there's so many concerns and lots of problems. And again, if they're really building an unattractive building, remember, they get out of all their property tax by arguing that their building was so awful. Oh, what a white elephant that nobody could use it for anything else, so you don't had, you couldn't possibly charge us property tax on that. Well, the only reason it was ostensibly a good deal for the township was that they would get two mils of tax on that land, but if you never pay any tax, then I don't think you get the two mils. <laughs> and, you know, I guess they've already announced they're going to build an ugly building. <laughs> it's sort of the new approach. Isn't this is a new for, approach. For, for, and this is, this is a company that prides itself in art collecting and yes. supporting the arts in the community. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, no mm, way. They, so, there's a plan for an ugly building. You don't have to go very far. <laughs> well, I, I, so this is going to be an it's interesting project. the city market, which has been replicated oh, in Iowa Haven. Yes, it has. Yeah, I hate to think. Maybe we're going to get one of those. I don't know. So I will keep everybody uh, posted, uh, uh, updated on that. We'll see what happens at the township meeting tonight that's going to start at 8 o'clock. But we are joined this evening by my friend Sam Rose of the Forward Future Institute still, or do I have, or is that the, f give me the proper name of it. Well, you know, I've changed employers. I work for a telco company now, Comlink. Comlink. And uh, still a partner in Hollymead Capital Partners. Hollymead Capital, aha. Yeah. And you're not doing Future Forward. Not really. I'm not really. Not, we're, all the rest of us are still engaged in stuff together, but not under that name. Okay, I understand. Because you've been very involved, and we may talk a little bit about some of the things you've done with food people in town and so forth. Mm -hmm. But the real reason that we wanted to bring Sam in tonight is we have seen this explosion of interest in uh, Mr. Snowden, Edward Snowden, mm -hmm. who's brought attention to the fact that people who know how technology works at that fundamental level, first of all, they have skills that the rest of the world doesn't have, and it makes them hard to assess. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, many people who have been talking about Mr. Snowden, have, Edward Snowden, the person who in the Guardian newspaper has been revealing the NSA eavesdropping and all of the tapping into all of the governments tapping into all of our various kinds of telephone and electronic media. And I think, you know, that remains such a mystery to so many people. The digital world is still so new that people don't really realize from your perspective, Sam, as somebody who does understand this mm -hmm. stuff and IT stuff, mm -hmm. is Snowden legit? Does he know what he's talking about? Yeah, I think I think he's definitely legit, and most people in the industry understood right away, you know, that he was legit. And frankly, there's been a lot of reports about this way before he talked. He just talked about new dimensions of it, like, hey, this is still going on. You know, I mean, I think okay. it was, he he performed a valuable service by saying that. And all the way back, I think we really, there was a transition that we took from the year 2000 to 2010. And that's actually where, how you guys were just talking about a moment ago, that there's this change and nobody realized, yeah. you know, you're in. It happened with technology, too. We really crossed into a real technocracy that went way beyond where this computer technology was used before around the year 2000, when, you know, basically when people switched over from having dial-up internet to high broadband internet, and then having it come into their pocket and having ah. a device that can follow you around and see what, where you're at and doing most of your communication through networks that can be listened to, whether it's through Gmail, email, or Facebook or whatever. And now you're telling me, if I'm a company like Facebook or Gmail, you're telling me everything that you like, everyone that you know, and everything about everything that you do all the time, everywhere. You know, it, it, Unless you're not posting on there, then you're not doing that, you know? 
and they they can infer a lot even with what you're not saying. Well, this is the interesting thing to me too. Well, oh, by the way, this is LCC Radio WLNZ eighty nine point seven here in Lansing, Michigan. Don't want to get in trouble with the government for that because <laughs> uh, we know they're listening. Um, one of the things that fascinates me about this is I think a lot of people say, yeah, but they don't really know that much. But I'm starting to look, there's a book called Big Data. Mm -hmm. And I was reading the other day in Business Insider, and they were arguing that the next big technological leap is not going to be hardware. It's not going to be that. It's going to be the ability of people to probe these big data sets, mm -hmm. link them together, and by communicating with those larger data sets, they will absolutely know everything about you, and it's going to be almost impossible to be mm -hmm. off the grid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think so. I think, like, a lot of people, because they're afraid of technology, like, they don't even equate the rights and the kind of political viewpoint and the, the social political um, stance that we've had about how we have a right to privacy or a right to communicate, um, how we're, as we as a citizens are supposed to govern, how the government uh, governs us, you know, that we're supposed to actually be the final say in that. And instead, once technology came into place, that's what technocracy means. It means these people, whoever controls the, the technology, controls the society in, in a technocracy. And that's where we're pretty much getting deep into that space already. And people don't even, they don't even, because they don't understand, I think because people lack the literacy of, the fundamental literacy of how network technologies work, right. that they are lost with how that resolves to um, their rights and how they're going to be responsible citizens that are going to try to check the government for how they're doing this. And the government's just pushed fast forward on it. They've dumped a bunch of money into, you know, getting beyond... Um, you running out ahead of your ability to keep them in check as citizens. So I think like the best thing that people can do over the next five to seven years is learn how this works. You know, become digital media literate, become computer literate, understand how all this stuff works as much as possible. That's really what I think. A good friend of this show, Todd Hayward, who is openly HIV positive, um, worries a lot about all of the criminalization of that issue, but also the privacy issues mm -hmm. related to whether you have testing and what your test results are. It's getting to the point where, I, if I'm understanding big data correctly, they're not going to have to tap into any kind of secret record in order to determine that you're HIV positive. There will be a certain set of markers that any insurance company, just by looking at the records and probing data, large data sets, they'll be able to come up with a list of people that they view as high risk for this, mm -hmm. high risk for that. And they will start rating you in your insurance for those things. That will start to become part of your permanent record, which may or may not influence whether companies want to hire you. I mean, I was reading the other day that there's people who make certain paint choices in their cars are more pr prone to certain kinds of accidents. So insurance companies will start differentiating in their actuarial tables. Well, if you want a red car, you're going to have to pay more in your insurance for it. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we fully realize the implications that has, not just in the government realm, but in the private realm. Mm -hmm. They're going to start mm -hmm. rating us, aren't they, and charging yeah. us. And, and, it's, and it's accurate, too. It's not made up things like these are. They can actually look at these pictures of data, if, if they're real collections of stuff you've done, and they can infer everything that you're talking about. You know, it's real. I mean, and so it also comes down to like, would, would we allow the government to pass a law that would allow an insurance company to do that to us kind of thing? You know what I mean? You're That's right, a policy right. thing. But, um, you know. Can we stop them? And, and I mean, yeah, we, it, I guess we can't stop the government from doing No, I mean, could we, <laughs> could we stop the government? Could they even pass a law that would make sense that would say they can't do yeah. that? Yeah, and it's, and it's funny because nobody understands how it works. And so... It's just like you're put, and you know that you need to use these technologies to get by now. So you're going to put all your information into it, and then people are going to capitalize on that. And, and and the only thing that I can really think is if people start getting together and teaching other how, each other how to use this stuff and how it works, and when they're putting information and what they're actually doing, I think that's the only, it's a very difficult step, and people aren't used to it. And we've all been taught, like, well, that's somebody else's problem. It's the IT guy or the or right. somebody has a role to know that, and I'm going to defer to him like a lawyer knows the law and the IT guy knows IT. But because of the, the prevalence of technology and because it's within our grasp and there's actually a lot of positive, empowering things about the network technology, if people learn it, they can actually, you know, move themselves forward a lot more if you think about Everything maybe that you've done with technology since oh, God. You know, 1995. I just, it's a marvel. Mm -hmm. You and know, uh, about three months ago, I got a notice from my auto insurance company. Uh, they're starting a pilot 
where they want to didn't exactly say how they would do it, but basically they would monitor your driving. So is it the Progressive has the little thing you click into your car? This wasn't Progressive, but I think that would be very similar to what they do. And, you know, they'd see if you're driving fast, you yeah. know, all those mm -hmm. kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And No, I don't think I want that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they'll claim... Well, they're telling you they'll give you a discount if yeah. you're a good driver. So. Exactly. And they'll claim that they don't look at things like how fast you're driving, but rather like how recklessly you drive, like how hard you hit the brake. And, and maybe that's the case. But a lot of people, I'm sure, turn that down because, you know, it's. And it, but for a company, it's like the more that they can digitize and automate all this information, the easier it is for them to run their business, basically. Well, sure. Look at, I don't know if um, our listeners, uh, any of them, have ever run a credit report on themselves. Oh, that's always a joy. That <laughs> is like, God dang, they know more things than I forgot. Mm -hmm. I mean, they remember things that were incidental. Right. Beyond incidental. Mm -hmm. That's what Snowden was talking about. They can paint a picture of you that's not inaccurate because the facts are maybe accurate. But there are things that you wouldn't emphasize about your life. <laughs> no, not at yeah. all. Yeah. I had a very bizarre situation. I lived in Parma, Michigan. And at the time I was married to a man named Ron Johnson who was quite ill. And so we were Bonnie and Ron Johnson in Parma, Michigan. Did we know that there were two Bonnie and Ron Johnsons in Parma, Michigan? No. Did the bank know? Yes, because we both had loans from the same bank. Mm. But this was in an era before computers, and everything was entered by hand. In the hand era, it meant that it was really just a crapshoot as to where, whose payment went on which account. Oh, yeah. I mean, years later, we found out that our accounts had been tangled for years, and you know, they'd get three of our payments, we'd get two of theirs on different things. <laughs> And, um, you know, we thought, and I, so I was always so delighted that computers would straighten that out, of mm -hmm. course. Mm -hmm. But what we also discover, Sam, is that sometimes it's the computer error that you really can't correct. Mm -hmm. A human might be able to sort those out sure. and put a big red flag on it so when anybody physically went to the file, it would say, be aware of the fact there's two people with identical names who live in the same town. Mm -hmm. But a computer sometimes... I mean, we see people on the no-fly list who fought that for years and they can't get themselves off. It's true, it's true, yeah. I think, I mean, to me, there's a lot of people data mining all of us right now. And like you were just saying, like Bill was just saying, it's worth data mining yourself. It's worth to, yeah. to start to learn how to do that. Even if you don't learn how to program or learn how it all works, if you start learning how to look at the picture that you could, at least what's available to you, you know, and, and, and data mine yourself, you start to see the impression that other people get. Um, it, I think it can make you less vulnerable. There's a lot of criminal people that are data mining you now in addition to... Well, know, identity they, theft is so yeah. huge. But, and they use they actually use a data mining approach, though. Like they'll use, they use automated approaches to data. So, right, they do. They, yeah. they're, that's how they're... They're either scraping it because they're physically going... There are now new... I was, somebody was talking last night at Meyer when I was there, very late Saturday night. Mm -hmm. there, that you now don't even have to run your card. You have to tap it on the machine mm -hmm. because it can read the strip... Yeah. But the problem is there are also people circling who are yeah. picking up some of this. Yeah. Radio so, frequency ID chips, RFIDs. They call, yep, yeah. they call them in, yeah. And and there's for any technology, especially if it's related to like your personal identity or finance, there's people that are constantly devising ways to try to get a hold of it, you know, and it's a it's a huge problem. Seems to me like if you have devices like credit cards and stuff, it's a matter of time until someone steals your number. That's what it seems like. Well, they're, they're starting to uh, market wallets that protect your credit oh. card so it can't be identified that A way. nice lead wallet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah lead wallet. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's funny in that you mentioned big, da big data. It's like the, the further we go down this road, the more we seem to be coming to like this big you know, collision point where right. you're going to have so much information online, so many people trying to steal your information, so many worries about governments all over the world watching you and spying on you, and so many companies competing for your attention to put all your information into their bucket, like Google and Facebook. And it's just overwhelming. It just to in the landscape itself is overwhelming for people, and they don't have time to do the homework, and they don't have time to figure this out. Um, and the alternatives that exist, there's there's alternatives. I mean, we can set up our own servers and do this and that. Right. Nobody's going to do it. No. You know, I mean, I do it, but you know, you would be this tiny little, you know, shard of like uh, subversive people, <laughs> and you're going to be seen now. The longer that we go in this direction, where we hand it all over to big companies, if you try to do something on your own, you all you'll be suspect. Be suspected just because you tried to do it on your own. Right. Why aren't you using you know the big <laughs> system like everybody else? Why are you trying to set up? 
all this private software. You this must is, have something to hide. This is LCC Radio, WLNZ 89.7 here in Lansing, Michigan. We're talking with Sam Rose, and he is um, the person who understands how to set up networks and do all that sort of stuff. There is right now the dark web. Mm -hmm. And I've been fascinated by it, but I'll tell you the honest truth, because I am not enough of a technician as you are. I'm afraid to dip into it for fear that all of a sudden I tap into something and then the next thing I know some guy in a black suit says, uh-oh, you inadvertently downloaded kitty porn or something. Yeah. That because you're trying to get into the dark web and you're trying to root around in a place that is hidden from view, you may well end up at sites that put, make you very vulnerable to that kind of thing because obviously people are still trying to monitor it. I think, I think that's a wise choice to make when you're nowadays yeah when you're and, a novice and, and i mean it's the things just keep incrementally going towards um you know everybody kind of walk, looking over everyone's shoulder and right. being more and more paranoid about who's doing what and everyone becoming more and more suspect even though we're all the same people we were like last year <laughs> or, you know <laughs> but spy <laughs> versus spy versus but spy see, you would have the skills and so you tell me is the government inevitably going to get get everybody who's in anonymous and throw them all away for 20 years? Oh, they probably will. I think they will, unless you know they go somewhere where the where like the U.S. government can't get them. But that's the direction it seems to be going in, and they've been setting this up since all the way since like about 2001. And you probably remember when like Admiral Poindexter wanted to set up the total information awareness yes. system. And was Which no, was called TCI, and it was yeah. bad yeah. acronym. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Should have been TIA, but it was TCI. Yeah. I don't yeah. remember. TMI, I guess. And, and you know, and, and then Congress was like, "Oh no, we can't do this," you know. And, and then it was kind of reported like, "Okay, we're not doing that." And then, right. like a month later, they said, "We're just rename it and did the whole entire thing." And, and much more than on. he had ever and planned. Since, since then, and they just kept evolving it. They're like, "Wow, no one's doing anything about this. No one's stopping us." You know, there was one little kind of guff about it. And here we are today, and, and you're going to keep hearing about whistleblowers that will keep telling you the, the extent to which it all goes. I mean, yeah, they've split fiber optics and they route all that off, and they've been doing that all the way back since. Yeah, what you're talking about is the main pipe goes in to the, to, from the telco company. The government just simply splits off part mm -hmm. of that pipe mm -hmm. and runs it to its own little facility and loads and, it. And I would say it's plausible that you can almost guarantee that they do that with every major carrier. and and. And if you look at the traffic now, it is far less point to point where people, you have individual people that connect to servers and far more lot, huge amounts of data that go through your pipe goes into a big pipe that goes into the broadband, basically. It's all broadband. Right. And so it's a lot easier for them to monitor that. There's one choke point that they can put this splitter on and, you know, per carrier and listen in on it, you know, where if you, almost all of them, if you look at if you look at the network maps that are out there for how all these fiber carriers are routed, they all have hubs, and that's all they have to do is go into these hubs. And there's been reports going all the way back to like 2002 that they had some room in the back of AT&T somewhere or whatever that no one could go into. You know, it's <laughs> interesting, this, just in case everyone forgets a little bit about history, this day in history in 1972, five guys broke into Watergate to burglarize the Democratic Party headquarters there. They would have they broken it, no. Yeah, they wouldn't, they, they wouldn't have to bother doing anything yeah. so no. mundane. No, they never would have been caught by the security guard with the tape on the door. No. no. The only thing they might have been caught is if they left a trail of breadcrumbs on the way into the network. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you know, one of the things I read the other day that really kind of jolted me is that it seems that if we don't get a handle now, we may never get a handle on this whole system because Somebody was writing the other day, a group of us, um, I had a lot of students that were very exercised about SOPA and PIPA. These were two laws that were proposed, where basically what it says was that large corporations, their data would be handled more expeditiously than yours might. If you're a little Fred Jones and you've got a little dinky website, if somebody tries to get to that address, it might take a little longer because, after all, the major traffic would be able to be, there'd be priority packets mm -hmm. for large corporations. Mm -hmm. And those laws went down in flames because people really were incensed at the idea that one of the things the web has done is democratized information where the little guy has as much of a chance as the big guy does. You can come to some of my websites and you can't really tell the difference whether I'm a, if I'm a sophisticated designer, it can look cool, right? Mm -hmm. But they've now told me that I was just reading the other day that they don't need any law because there are ways that they can, through the kind of networking that you're talking about, speed up their data to the point where you're going to get shut out anyhow. Mm -hmm. So I mean, is government becoming irrelevant some in some ways in the control of the system? Well, yeah, they, I think they just stay out of the way and 
the folks that own the networks and the largest companies have really good lobbying groups and really good connections to the government. And what they, what they get in return is what you're now hearing about, access to listen to all this important data from Facebook and Google and Verizon and whatever. And that's the unspoken agreement. It's kind of like, okay, we'll stay off your back. And you hand us, this is what I think. This that's what I think, too. It's not expressed, theory. is it? I mean, I, I can't point to like a, P, a document that says the yes, right. exact <laughs> promise or whatever. But if you think about it, I mean, right. look at what's coming to light and then look at what you're talking about. And even there's always kind of like there's groups that have been watchdogs about this and they cause a, a bit of an uproar and they get some press time. But then in the end, nobody cares. And they just say, you know what, This is there's money to be made in doing this. And so... That's what rules, usually not you know, citizens' rights or equal access. And that was all in the 70s. Those, those days are gone. Everybody, they are. <laughs> you know, Bill and I remember those days. They're not supposed to be gone because you already fought the fight once. We're not supposed to refight fights after 20 years after everyone forgot that we fought it in the first place. But that's what happened. When government and uh, corporations collude at that level, to the point where they're speaking each other's language and they don't even need to have express agreements because it's just understood that they will take care of each other. I think that's what we're really talking about with the kind of cyber fascism, mm -hmm. that it's really impossible for the individual then to be able to fight against all this yeah. big data. The worst a corporation can do to me in some ways is bankrupt me. Mm -hmm. They can steal my financial information or they can decide that I'm a bad risk health-wise and charge me more for insurance. But government can put me away. So, mm -hmm. I mean, government scares me even more. That's the reason the Snowden thing mattered to me more was, uh, you know, everybody says, well, I get, you tell it Facebook everything anyhow, so who cares? But, you know, Facebook can't put me in jail. No. Facebook can't send a drone to my house and decide that they can lob tear gas into mm -hmm. it. You know, I mean, that's that's what kind of scares me. Yeah, and, and I see that coming. In the, and, and I, I mean, you can see what happened since 2011 when, you know, the whole Occupy Wall Street movement or whatever. And that's what they used to find all these people were databases. They did, the didn't they? Mm -hmm. They rounded them up and threw them all in jail. Those were the first people that actually were willing to do something about the problems going on in our country. And that's what, I mean, you're, you're right to fear it because you see what happens with, when people go to some extreme and actually start taking an action. Yeah. And, you know, and you can see all these other laws being, of course, being written that have necessarily nothing to do with um, technology, but more of like what you can do and how you can protest and, you know, what you can say bad about the government, you know. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, I, I still think time is of the essence, but I think the first step for most people is to start learning <laughs> this stuff. And I actually think if people did learn how this worked, it would a lot of the balance of power would shift back. To I people. do too. And people wouldn't maybe they wouldn't dismiss the idea that you would set up your own server or website or channel to have chat through and not just go and use Facebook because that's what everyone's using and stuff like that. And, you know, I, I used to be really into that and really advocate it, and it was kind of like yelling into a empty alleyway or something. So are there really smart spies and terrorists? They're not going to use the normal channels anymore. Oh, yeah, true. And yeah. they haven't probably been for some time. They're mm -hmm. probably back to blind drops, you know, in post, post offices or something. And I think that's why, you know, our schools, when we talk about teaching a foreign language, what we should make sure is that every young person is taught code. I mean, that's the one language they should learn. Mm -hmm. Because in some ways, first of all, it is a language, and it kinks your brain in a certain way to help you understand how data is part of the, you know, we live, we are basically a bunch of ones and zeros, mm -hmm. sad but true. We are almost mm -hmm. reducible to that level of machine code. Yeah. And to be able to understand that at some sort of profound human level, I think, really helps us figure out what we do. There was a book by Ellen Ullman that I read back in 2003. I looked it up, and it was called Close to the Machine. Mm -hmm. And she said one of the real downsides of shifting to a digital world is the loss of human discretion. Mm -hmm. She said in the old days, if you were the social worker and you were out in the neighborhood and you had a client and they had a teenage girl that wanted to go to the prom and there was not enough money to get her the dress, you found a way to manipulate the system to get her a few extra bucks that month so she could get the dress at Goodwill for the daughter to go to the prom. You can't do that anymore in a computer system. In fact, when you are a social worker and somebody comes to you in desperate need, if they don't have precisely the right documents that can be scannable with the right barcodes, you can't get them anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the real challenge is that there's no discretion in these machines then. The human factor is left out. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and there's, there's this weird dichotomy because that's the technocracy that comes out of our government and big corporations. But then you also see people online who just do things like 
you know, Kickstarter or whatever, like, yeah. give me some money and I need help. And Go like, fund me. Give you money directly. And it's basically the opposite of what you just said. <laughs> right. Know? And, and if people began to, to start thinking about what could I do if I just had full access with this technology and learn how it worked, they could be doing a lot of that kind of stuff and they could be doing like community policing and, and yes. um, sharing information about community gardens and take over a lot of the stuff like in a place like Flint where, you know, there's no one there that's going to help them with all the infrastructure. But there's a lot of things that you can do now with computers to run the infrastructure. I worked with a group out in Denver where one of the things that is so traumatic for crime victims, especially victims of domestic violence and sexual assault, is that when they go in for services and they go in for medical attention, they have to tell these stories over and over again, which re-traumatizes them. And we were trying to build an electronic file that that person could carry with them so that once they gave that story and all the information was there, the other agencies would agree to accept that as their signature file and the person didn't have to repeat all those traumatic incidents anymore. And we couldn't make it happen. Wow. Because people yeah. didn't want that. I mean, the the agencies didn't want that. They mm -hmm. want to have their own special mark on it. But I think, I mean, I, there, there, so there could be positive ways to do this. Sure, sure. Yeah, there's a lot of things, and it's and you know, it'll usually hit the dead end. And and the, you know, when if you think, well, we've got to get all the stakeholders at the table. You know, we have to have like let's say the government. They mm -hmm. should be at the table. And I agree with that. But often, the, if you have an idea like the one you just articulated. The people that end up killing it are those are the yeah. the technocracy. But if you look at the medical industry, which have been yes, through, I mean that's where Sam's helping to yeah, try you, to. You have to repeat everything oh. every day ten mm -hmm. times. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Don't. Why can't you look it up? Yeah. <laughs> it drives you crazy. If, yeah. And that's what, one that has not been reformed in any way, shape, or form. Put a chip right. in my butt. Yeah, you, you know, know and they, scan me. When you when they you can see they have a computer behind the window. Yeah. And they're like, here's a form. Fill, it, fill out. it out. Tell me what all the diseases you told me you had last time. All yes. the stuff that you did, you know, from when you were born. It drives now. me up a wall. It's really yeah. Now, come on. Yeah. That's <coughs> what what drugs. Are you and doing? the older I get, the, the 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 I'm just so nasty now. I leave off half of them now. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, then, I've got so much more to put down. And then it's counterproductive. It's like they can't. You know, if they use this new record, why do you have to do that? It spends like, you spend like an hour in there. The out. wasted <laughs> time. No, so I understand why the Obama <coughs> government, you know, says with the new system, we're going to have so much digitized that we will save all this money and save all this time. On the other hand, now that we find out how much they're snooping in our personal <laughs> records, you say to yourself, wait a minute, yeah. maybe it wasn't such a bad idea that that was on a sheet of paper in somebody's file cabinet because at least that would have been harder for them to find. It's true, yeah, it's true. And, and and even, you know, outside of like, you know, and that's true, and there's and everything is going to be available to them with these, with a, some kind of secret subpoena that nobody knows about. And everyone in the government is like, okay, this is great, except like, you know, Ron Paul or whoever. Yeah. And a couple people spoke out against it, and everyone was like, no, no, we have to have this for. No, the strange you know, bell, bedfellows of Glenn Beck and Michael Moore. Yeah. They're going to go on the road together and start urging everybody to. You know, every, every so called or seemingly mainstream on all sides of the aisle seem to be before this so yeah. that, that tells me that it's gonna it's everything's fair game that's in a, on a, di a disc somewhere right with a network connection right <laughs> it's not gonna be nothing you know what else it does it opens you, yourself or the, the world up to all kinds of um, blackmail mm -hmm. oh yes it does or, yeah. you know if you push it too far we're gonna tell you these things yeah. I, I, I knew somebody that collected the large debts for American Express hmm. Um, if you didn't pay your American Express card, this person was the one that went after everything that was, you know, 100000 and over. And basically what he'd do is look at their buying record and he'd call up someone and say, you know, you're probably going to send us this check tomorrow because if you don't, I'll tell your spouse that yes. you bought three diamond rings in Vegas oh, or yeah. something. I'm, no, that's it, true. It's like bang. <laughs> yep, true. money's there tomorrow. And even even with like a more there's a more formalized kind of system where you have an institution that has to put out public records, like a university or whatever, and they actually um, have to pay someone else to do this records management to purge records so that people don't look for ways to sue them based on this right. they data mine that stuff. Right. And they, so they have archivists that are supposed to put the archives out there, and then <laughs> records managers that are supposed to go and delete <laughs> everything that they're battling each other out in the you know, electronic dueling systems of universities and like foundations and you know people that have to report.
Probably. This is LCC Radio, WLNZ 89.7 here in Lansing, Michigan. We're talking with Sam Rose about online security, and I remember the days when my friend, and he was a great guy, I don't know, I don't know if he's still alive, actually. He was a psychiatrist who worked for uh, Southern Michigan Prison, okay? And he was also had a private practice. And so he let some of the guys at the prison earn a little extra money, and they were transcribing the tapes of the sessions from his private practice. They didn't take very long to figure out there was a thriving business when the woman was talking about her illicit affair and calling her and saying, give my wife 10 grand or your husband finds out about the affair. So, I mean, this is the kind of thing. I mean, we all think that, well, if we're blameless and we don't have anything to hide, that life is going to be okay. There's almost, there's something in your life that you yeah. would be unhappy if it became public. Mm -hmm, sure. So, I mean, that's the difficulty that we all face. This, I don't think that many of the people who say, well, I don't care, are all that, you know, we can't all be that pure. Maybe they are. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people would care, and there's a lot of things that people would want shared, and they have thought that could never be shared, like medical records or like yeah. uh, criminal record information. You know, there's a lot of stuff, actually, that's publicly available that's not easily accessible right now today, and I think a lot of that will come into databases that are searchable and findable in the next five to ten years. Everything's going to end up getting digitized, I would guess. So, Me too. You know that. Uh, How do you hook him up? Because you know the. Um, uh, oh, I'm blanking on his name, but he's basically the um, inventor of the you know, the internet there. Um, Tim Berners. Tim yeah, Tim Berners Lee. I mean, he is really talking big data. He's mm -hmm. saying that the, what we can do with this is marvelous. Yeah. We just need government to share all of its databases and private industry. We can hook them all together. What are some of the good things that it can yeah. do? Well, they, you know, there was a convincing that happened with um, the United Kingdom and the United States. And so there's a website called data.gov, and that there's probably an equivalent yep. like data.co.uk or whatever. And they began to publish data in this format called uh, Resource Description Framework, which is basically just a way to make it really easy to reuse. And, and um, if you had, if, if all three of us had a different database, if we put it out in this way, I could query across all three of them without doing uh -huh. a lot of work. Uh -huh. So we, you could just say, show me everything in my database where there's conditions in Bonnie's database that are, you know, like X, Y, Z. And mm -hmm. it would show from both. And, it would, you could, and, and then you can also make rules, and, which is basically inference. So all of us are familiar on the web from the mid-90s till now with search, where you're yes. searching for something. And search uses this uh, algorithm that they call map reduce. And it basically just takes every letter in there in combination and it maps it out. And so as you start typing them in, it's got a, you know, a pointer for the letter M, the letter MA, and the letter MAP. You know? And that's a bunch of different information. But the way that Tim Berners' lead idea works is you actually would make kind of like a, a statement about the information. If you would say map is a model of the landscape or something. And that okay. would be the data that you store. In it. And then Google doesn't do this right now. And a lot of the databases that we can access are just searching right. oriented. They Wasn't he have... saying Wolfram Alpha, would, Alpha, which was the new type of search database that he was mm -hmm. putting together, it would be the kind of thing where you could just query by saying, yeah. don't just tell me about all the studies about breast cancer. Tell me what merged together they say is the best thing for somebody with stage 4 breast cancer who has tried this chemo mm -hmm. and it didn't work. What would be their best option yeah. then? And, uh, and that's yeah. very sophisticated. I mean, that's mining all the information. Mm -hmm searching it and deciding what the consensus is within those studies and then reporting it back to the person. Yeah, there's, there's, some, there's a lot of technology, and it's funny, this is where we're at now, is like what, is act, what actually can happen is like, you know, very small and a, and a very larger line can be drawn to what's possible right now. So yeah. right now we could do something very advanced, but what most people are using and what's actually being invested in and developed is way back here in a small, you know, and so... That's happening with everything with technology now. I mean, the hospitals are way back here giving you a piece of paper when they put it yeah, in a okay. database, and et cetera, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, on and on and on. Yeah, we could you do know, all of these marvelous we, things. There's, a, there's a, millions of things we could do with like smartphones and this and databases. And, and everything that Tim Berners-Lee talked about 
with semantic web and, and doing yeah. queries that are natural language based and yeah. meaning making is 100% completely possible to do with just out of the box technology. So is right the now. government really taking all of our data and saying, Bill Castaner, ah, we remember you from the 60s and we've got all this stuff that's now getting digitized and we're keeping an eye on you for X, Y, and Z. Or is it really dumb and it just goes, oh, we got the wrong Bill Castaner. Yeah. <laughs> do we know how dumb they are or how smart they are right now with well, all the spying they're doing? Yeah, but, well, I, I believe to an extent that they're probably looking for um, terrorists at this point or they're looking for you know international criminals I believe they're not prioritizing um, citizens because I think if they were they'd be coming and knocking on people's doors and doing something if that if that was like a big you know concern but the problem is that that's a slippery slope from, the potential there. I mean once they've got this database and they and they're piping our information through yes they may only be looking at this window on it but it's so easy to write a different query with the same framework that now looks at, you know, America instead of the people that are talking to Americans. You know what I mean? They're, oh, yeah. They're, they're filtering all that data through, and they're supposed to be looking for, that's what they tell us, you know, we're, we're just looking for people that are, you know, terrorists or talking to terrorists. But that same, whole, that building blocks that made that looking for terrorist framework can easily be turned on America, and it probably will be eventually. It seems you the know, temptation is just too great. Even if it's just like the weakest Americans or those people who are causing problems or getting in the way of government or, you know, it's... So tea, I was tea party in the IRS. Yeah. Well, I actually think it's going to be drug dealers. <laughs> yeah, oh, drug dealers. Because, always. you know, they established uh, the RICO laws for certain things and then very quickly they said, you know, and it was terrorist, and then very quickly they said, well, it should apply to drug dealers as yeah. well. So that's sort of the foot in the door. That could be a good signal. It's like whoever is starting to be looked at as terrorists are going to be the targets inside of the country. For, exactly. Um, I figure they'll <laughs> be the ones too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but but I, I mean, there's. I think it's really worth spending time on the positive too. I mean, you get actually get a lot of the negative you can get from mainstream media, but a lot of people don't understand what is empowering about technology, what's positive about it. And to me, it's the only pathway where people are going to wake up and say, "Oh yeah, we're we're supposed to be." free citizens that govern, you know, that yeah. <laughs> control our yeah. government. And, you know, instead of thinking like, oh, God, I don't control this software, so I better... Think of how empowered I felt today. I discovered that The Guardian was holding at 11 o'clock a webcast with Edward Snowden. Right. And I found out at like two minutes to 11. And so I went in and I posted a question. I don't know if it got answered. I've been trying to search through the new... But, but within just a very brief period of time, they had 2,200 questions that had been posted. I mean, what you also discover is that, I mean, there's this mass response, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, you know, but you do get your shot. You have a shot now. You can ask a question. Yeah. This is an international story of immense, uh, you know, immense importance. Yeah. And average citizens are getting a chance to put a question in the hopper. That seems to me to be a miracle in and of itself. I, I agree, yeah. You know, and to finish answering your other question, that so the, our government made these databases. And if you look, they kind of stuck. So they, they started doing this, and so did the UK. They started making these publicly available Yeah, databases. what happened? And then they just kind of trailed off. And I think what happened is that, in my opinion, this is my theory, is that people realized how powerful it would be. I wonder about that. To make census data and all of the data that the USDA collects and all of the data that the EPA collects into a queryable, you know, where you can yes. ask a question like, what is the town that has the most pollution with the population of under 10,000? Boom, and get all that. Ask a question like that. And then factor it for race and see if there's racial bias exactly. and where we're polluting. All those points and all those data points ah. are queryable. Well, look how surprised the public was when they discovered that they could tell how you voted. Right. <laughs> yes. I, mean, I remember being surprised. Yeah. And I didn't feel good about it. Well, so. that you voted. Yes. yes. Yeah. And because, well, they pretty much know if you're Well, in that. an open primary, yeah. too. When well, you've got a closed primary, right. then all of a sudden it's pretty easy to figure out how that person voted. So right. that's what makes it so difficult. Yeah. So they can really, they can say how you voted, what your medical conditions are, how much money you make. All the things that you think you're keeping private are by now probably private, uh, open mm -hmm. to somebody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. what I think was interesting, too, to me about Edward Snowden, and I think the place where they're getting so much pushback from the government, is that he's saying he had the authority and this was confirmed by uh, some reports over the weekend, and now they're the government's trying to push back and saying, no, those reports are wrong, that he could search anybody without a warrant, warrantless mm -hmm. searches. Mm -hmm. If they were allowing warrantless searches, I think that's really um, infuriating. There's 1.2 million people with top uh, secret clearance. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can trust 1.2 million people to root around in other people's data and yeah. not... 
Oh, I'm sure it was happening. I, I would be shocked and amazed if the, if the scenario that you said is not exactly what yeah. was happening behind the scenes. I mean, they couldn't do anything yet. I mean, it, nobody came and knocked on our doors and hauled us away. Right. But it's still, you know, they're by law. They shared information to... with your ex-husband, though. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Think how much fun it would be, the, the novel about how many of those folks are spies for foreign government. <coughs> you have it to wonder. Yeah, you know there are. Yeah. 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 But, I mean, it's sort of like when you have information on everybody, it almost then becomes irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, you can't possibly scope out everybody and decide. I mean, you'd have to figure out, so you know all this about them, so what can you do with it? Yeah, exactly. And But, I mean, the thing that it is infuriating that there's supposed to be a check that, you yeah. know, people that we elect or somehow have a say in getting empowered are able to say whether they get to look at our information or not and with that happening that's a big that's a big problem if we all still believe in that i which i guess we did like i was saying like in the 70s and then we just thought like you know whatever you know one of the things that's <laughs> kind of fascinates me too sam is that i a lot of people who are supervising the it guy right don't have a clue true, true. um sometimes they ask you to do the impossible or then figure you can get it done by lunch Sometimes they don't even know what you're doing, Very true. and you could snow them. I mean, one of the real problems with assessing this whole area of the field is that it's almost like you're a separate priesthood among us, and yeah. we have to trust you because you're the ones that are holding these sacred texts, yeah. and you're the only ones who can interpret them for us. And we don't know when you say that you can't do this, whether you really can or whether you just don't feel like doing it that yeah. day. You know, I mean, it, you have enormous <laughs> power. That's true. I've, I mean, I've seen that play out for years and years, you know. I could tell you lots of stories about people who were fired and then called back and hired for a hundred dollars an hour to <laughs> fix something that they ran, and then were you know someone fired because they're angry and then they're like, "Will you come back and fix this?" You know that's very common. And, and all the things that you talk about happen beyond the shadow of a doubt. Yeah. And companies all over the place, and independent contractors and everybody, you know. And but at the same time, you know, it's kind of like a balance. People get about you know a huge bucket of requests that are impossible and they have to deal with that as a right. peer developer or whatever so you're kind of you know stuck in the middle of that and and again i mean i just i think people should gain literacies of how this stuff works and i think it would actually you know maybe it would destroy the priesthood and the income of a few people but i think that there would be like a huge explosion <laughs> of things happening out of that that would take its place anyway you know everybody's and, so surprised about snowden Making well, whether it's 122 or 200 thousand a year, as you know, as quote unquote a high school dropout. That's usually the first thing you learn about it, right? The reality is, if you can, this is a field still where if you can do it, it really doesn't matter if you have six degrees behind your name. It's true, it's true. Yeah, I, I don't have a lot of those degrees, yeah. and I've moved pretty far up in this field. And if you can, I mean, you can test someone and know if they know it. I, a lot of times when you do an interview for these jobs. You'll come in and they'll put a whiteboard up and they'll say, write me a piece of code that does this on a whiteboard. Oh, really? So without being in front of a computer. And fortunately, they have somebody there who can actually tell whether yours is right or not? Well, they'll, they'll, type, they'll type it all in. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> and see all. if it runs. I've done this. You have know, they? You know, oh. Especially getting you know employment recently. Yeah, I've, I've done this quite a bit. And, and if I hire people in the place that I work, it's a... It's a good method to see how people go about solving a problem and writing computer yeah. code. You know, yeah. you don't want you don't want someone to write computer code for your website or service that's you know badly thought out and insecure. I used to do a lot of Washington consulting in the era when twice the FBI invested more than a couple hundred million in a new system, and the new system never worked. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, those mega systems are still very difficult. I mean, that's why I can't quite make up my mind whether I think that the government is this sort of evil mastermind that can in real time follow me across the city, or whether they were bungling everything, and in chances that they're going to be following the wrong person to the yeah. bottom. I think they're almost there. I think what they've done is quietly from the late um, 1990s build out the infrastructure to follow you across the city. They put up cameras on all the street corners. They yeah. put up and, and they sanction cell towers that can follow you and triangulate where your cell phone is, and all, and then databases that will keep track of all that information. And then now, all they they're beginning to experiment with actually checking it out. Like, so let's take a look. We got this <laughs> let's follow Fred. Let's and run. Pick, a, pick a person. <laughs> yeah, and just see. Drive that person crazy. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. They're, they're trying it out now, and I think once they figure out the system, then we're not that far away from the system's up and running. The whole infrastructure to do that is up and running. I don't know that they're doing it to all of us yet, 
and I think they will. But the only problem for us, Bill, is we're so irrelevant, they won't bother yeah, no, to follow yeah, us. But if you're Fred's ex-wife, then they want to oh, you know, create see? some trouble for her today. See, that's it. You just need to have a friend who can tap into the system for you. That's sure. more important than almost anything else. That's I true. could get you to go back and give me a raise or do all sorts of wonderful <laughs> things for me. Huh? Well... Uh, last bit of advice to people, um, Edward Snowden says get yourself PGP privacy, I've been looking into that, you have a key, you give the other person a key and you can still keep everything pretty much secret from people, but it might just make you look suspect, you say. Well, it could, but I, I think it's still worth learning how that works and deciding for yourself whether, you know, whether what you're sending you want to be just between you and the other person. This is LCC Radio, WLNZ 89.7. Thank you for tuning in. This is Lansing Online News Radio with Bonnie and Bill. See you next Monday night. Boy, that was great. Mm. Sorry, took it right up to that. No, that's good. That's exactly what I want. We should take it all the way to the end. <laughs>